Gay SA Radio, where you are family. My name is Ray, and this is what went down on Rainbow Talk on the week ending 21st of September. Up next, here's Anna Marie chatting to Eric Mola about making a career from art. It's Gay SA Radio. I'm Anna Marie, and I'm going to chat to Eric Mola, exquisite artist, very successful, and dedicated teacher. Welcome to Gay SA Radio, Eric. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. It's absolutely wonderful. As I said to you just now, I'm a little bit intimidated by you. Your work is incredible. I've been stalking you on Facebook, and I've been looking at some of your writing and reading some of your writing. I've actually saved some of your writing because I find it quite incredible and a lot to think about. Do you suffer from Weltschmerz? Yes, I would certainly. I think um, that's picked up in my paintings. Um, I think sensitive viewers... Once they've, you know, looked past the celebration and the colour and the, the energy, they, they tend to find that haunting kind of the thing there. But I always make a point of, um, you know, also saying to people, I don't wallow in that. You know, it is not as if I would simply focus on, on an emptiness and a tiredness and a, a kind of I've had enough of life, you know, situation and then just wallow and stay in that. I like to move through the process and come out on the other side again and actually find more energy, find a sense of hope again. And so uh, it, it's a circular process, I yes. think. For me, when I look at the work that I have seen and that you've posted on Facebook, which is quite incredible. So for anybody listening, if you want to see more of Eric Mueller's work, go to Facebook if you can't go to an exhibition. For me, it feels like the, the, the Weltschmerz is like a light motif that goes right through the work. And the word cycle and life, those two words. Yes. It's a constant repetition there about it. You wrote on Facebook that you came to a place in your life where your body was starting to fail you. Mm. Let's talk about a little bit about that and how that influenced you as an artist. All right, so I came home one Friday afternoon. I'd been suffering from back pain on and off, you know, for, <laughs> for quite a while. But one Friday afternoon I came home and I thought, oh, I just need to lie down for a couple of hours, you know, and then I'll be fine again. And four hours later, I was still lying down and I was paralyzed. I couldn't get up. Well, your entire so, body paralyzed. Well, basically, I couldn't move. I could hardly breathe because of, of the pain. And um, fortunately, I had my phone next to me. And um, so I phoned my neighbor. He climbed over the wall, came in, and then he and his wife eventually got me out and I was screaming like a schoolgirl all the way <laughs> and they got me to hospital and okay so long process and I finally went for a, a you know operation on my back and they fused things together and put a whole bunch of steel rods in there but um, it wasn't completely successful so you know this is now a continuous thing and I'm basically continuously being reminded of the fact that you know you're not young and energetic and lovely all the time. And also, I think the fact that I went through the whole recovery process on my own. So, you know, I don't have a partner or there was nobody there to assist me. So doing that, and I found that incredibly frustrating because I'm used to being, you know, the guy who gets stuff done. And if I want something done, I do it myself and nothing stops me. And then suddenly there I was incapable of taking a, a cup off, off, a sh off a shelf that's too high. And that I think was in a sense a kind of a reality check, but it confirms what I paint about. It confirms what I write about. It confirms the kind of view I have of the life force and, and, and energies that come into play as we go through this, this thing we call existence. So I suppose, yeah, do I suffer from my art? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah. art is there to comfort the disturbed and disturb disturbed the comfortable. the comfortable. Indeed. Do you set out to do that because your work certainly does? Does that just happen? I think it just happens. I, I, I wouldn't say I deliberately, you know, set out to do that. What I try and do deliberately is to be honest, is to probe, just write down into my own mind and, 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 and just try and work out my own relationship with me and my mind and the understanding of things because I, I, I you know I sometimes do feel I'm, I'm really just very confused but then I realize that everybody seems to be it's easy to think you've got answers and of course the moment you open your mind and um, you try and sort of 
get these answers to be quite honest, then you realize that you actually don't have a clue. So. But that's part of the process, and that's also what I enjoy doing. So in a sense, I do it for myself. And then in the process, you know, if it does shake people up a little bit, good. If it shakes them up a lot, good. And if it simply resonates with them and there's a kind of harmony that they feel, then I'm happy too. You know, I don't necessarily feel that I have to explain my artworks. Sometimes people ask me, they want to know. A lot of people don't want to know. They want to find it for themselves. And I'm, you know, happy either way. It doesn't matter how they respond as long as there is a kind As of long response. as there is a response and not a mediocre response. Exactly. Which I don't think ever can happen with your art. There cannot be anything <laughs> mediocre. There is no, nothing yeah. mediocre about that. Do we ever get the answers? Do we ever stop being confused? No. What happens if we do? Because some people seem to have the answers. What do we think about oh, that? Goodness, no, that? That's Then you can just as well just give up and, I don't know, go and live in the mountains and be this ethereal being. I'm sure you've been asked this a million times. I'm going to ask you this. A young person comes to you with stars in their eyes and they're talented and they want to do art. And everybody says, no, don't, you're never going to make any money. It's not a life. We know that argument. What will you tell that person? Or will you look at the art first? Well, I think what I probably will ask is, do you want to be an artist? Do you want, is this, is this about fame? Is this about, you know, being special and, and having an excuse to be weird? Or is this a driving force within you? Is this important enough that it's like breathing? You know, if you stop doing it, then, then you start losing your mind. Because at the times in my life that I've decided, oh, I've had enough, you know, this is too difficult. Because it is difficult. I find art difficult. Um, it always is difficult. Whether it's the conceptualization or the actual work, it's always difficult. And that's probably why I still do it. But so if it is part of this process of something that you just absolutely have to do, because if I stop, like I said, I go funny. I it's get tools. very, yeah, I get very irritated and, and things. And then of course, the moment I start working, it somehow seems to just, um, you know, flow out of me. So I would maybe first of all, say to a youngster, decide what your reasons are. If this is about fame and fortune, it might be a better idea to, to do something else in the arts. You know, it is not because being an artist is a quiet job. We have to surround ourselves with silence a lot. And, and you work somewhere there, you know, in a space. And once every couple of years, you show your work to people. And um, if you mess up an exhibition, you've really messed up. You've got to fix it tomorrow night. Musicians are fortunate, you know, if they have one bad show, they can at least try and fix it tomorrow night. We work differently. So if you're okay with that, and if the process is about this understanding, you know, that it is kind of soul searching and, and a way to find sense in your own life, then go for it. And then of course, immediately I would say, well, now that you've decided to be an artist, draw, 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 draw. You carry your drawing book, your sketchbook with you, and you never stop drawing. Now here's Zianda chatting to Dion Magamani, a BCom student who attended the LGBTQ plus UJ Summit. We have our very own student. South Africa is famous for students that need transformation. From the early days, the students took up issues of oppression and we have our very own Dion today with us. Dion, thank you so much for um, availing yourself to sit on this panel. But then my question to you is, well, in this university space, issues around gender, sexuality, and so on are always uh, taught, talked about, have conversation, dialogues, within the faculties of humanities, areas of social science, and here you are studying in the field of commerce. And is there a space in this non-social science uh, fields to talk about issues of sexual orientation? Because you are doing number crunching, and those books, and I don't know whatever else you do in accounting, I dropped it when I went to my high school, right? So, because I couldn't even count to 10. But I want to know, as an accounting student, as a science student, as an engineer student, is there a space, a mining student, is there a space where we can learn 
about sexual diversity, about citizenry, about a society, because we will produce diverse sexual orientation students in the accounting field. They are there. They even have PhDs these days. Just watch. Uh, go on Facebook, you'll see they are there. <laughs> so, so in the accounting field, is there a space? In this non-social sciences world of, of uh, fields of study, is there a space for these issues? Um, thank you for starting the easy question, by the way. Um, <laughs> um, I'm actually an economy student, and I'm taught that I am looking at the world at large. I'm not just looking at the finances. Um, the science students do not just look at the sciences you have to go on with their degree, but rather just look into the world itself. There's just so much wrong, and we are the ones that are able to see it. And I think that regardless of what a student is studying, you must understand that they are the pistons of any social change that's ever going to happen in the world. We brought down a party. We brought down... Oh, yeah. We are also behind the business for movement. So I believe that students are the pistons of any social change. We as students are seeing so much wrong in the world, and we keep quiet. For instance, um, our African neighbors are committing homophobic crimes, they are engaging in activities that try to marginalize and disenfranchise the people, members of society. So, regardless of what a student is studying or what is a degree or whatever field they are certainly interested in, it needs a student to look into what's going on to the world. We, so, we see so much wrong into the world when we see people being arrested, when we see people being marginalized, when people are being killed within African countries. And we keep quiet. Regardless of where a student comes from or what they're studying, it falls to you to to the piston of that specific change. It falls to us to rewrite the narrative, to rewrite the African narrative, even regardless of what field we're in. Uh, I think, yeah, that's the basis of what I think students should be doing in order to change the world. Here's Hendrik chatting to Jason Fiddler about the Durban Gay and Lesbian Film Festival. Gay SA Radio, where you are family. I'm Hendrik, and in the studio with me, I have Jason Fiddler from the Durban Gay and Lesbian Film Festival. Jason, a welcome to the studio. Please tell us a little bit about the background of the festival, when it started, how many times it's been held, and uh, the history. It's the eighth Durban Gay and Lesbian Film Festival. We started in 2011, so in seven years, we've, we've just managed to do eight festivals. It's just the way the calendar worked out and begun in very humble circumstances in, in partnership with the KwaZulu-Natal Society of Arts Gallery. And this year, unfortunately, doing, due to a very large program on their part, uh, we, we were not able to use their venue, but we have managed to secure venues this year. So what are the details of the festival? It is Durban, okay. oh. and, and some of the girls don't mind coming to Durban. We are a little bit warmer, but we're always the lovely people to come and visit, and we love your money, so we'd love you to come as tourists to come and visit us. But uh, to come down to it, the date's t Friday, the 21st of September, running through to Sunday, the 30th of September. This year is a very full 10-day program because we are taking advantage of the Heritage Day weekend. So the Monday, the 24th of, of September is public holiday, and we're going to have a, a Monday screening. Normally we don't, but this year we will. So the opening weekend, four, four days of quite a quite a strong program. So why September? Why specifically? Well, it's Heritage Month. Um, the, the the team, my, my uh, assistant director, Mtoka Zizi Limbete, and the other guys, we, we, we workshopped this idea earlier. And the feeling is, is finding a, a, the ideal location in terms of a calendar for Durban. And we've, we've certainly experimented around the year. September being Heritage Month, taps us into a broader cultural awareness and, and intercultural diversity that Durban is quite proud of itself for. So we're tapping into that that's mainstream idea. It's also the time of year where um, it's getting a little bit warmer. It might be a, a rainy uh, type of experience, but nonetheless, Durban has always got a little bit of rain every time the film festival comes. I'm not Mujaji the Rain Queen, but I might be related, I'm not sure. The program seems to be very interesting. Uh, Very interesting program. In fact, this year, we, we really didn't anticipate having a big festival this year. You know, we don't have any formal headline sponsorship this year. So there was a lot of challenges in terms of what we, we get. But having said that, a lot of filmmakers globally really have identified the DGLFF as, as a great platform for their films to be seen. We have a very strong jury component. So there's always very good awards to be made as a filmmaker. 
Um, so this year we've we've been very privileged to be given the film uh, the George Michael Freedom documentary. It's a bit of a risk. We've never opened the festival with a with a, a documentary before, but on nearly two hours, it's an extraordinary journey that he made himself before his death. Um, and it and it takes us from his days as as wham as a as a young gay boy. He knew he was gay then. Of course, he wasn't out. And it takes the process of how fame had an impact on him. And he's very frank in how he first fell in love and is very open about that relationship. And we get to understand the man far more than we did before. So it's a terrific story to enjoy. And it comes with obviously all his great works, interviews with Sir Elton John amongst others. So it's a fascinating film to watch for the opening night. So that'll be Friday, the 21st of, of September. And we have a very proud moment. We are the world premiere for a South African film called She, um, which deals with an intersex teenager, um, trying to get into the Olympics and uh, as a swimmer, and she's forced or obliged to lower her testosterone levels in order to compete. So very similar parallel stories to what Casa Semenya is going through now with IAAF. Um, it's a terrific story, beautifully made, and it, I think it helps us add to the diversity of our program, which people have come to appreciate over the years. We have a very good trans uh, program this year, number of documentaries and short films that um, I won't use the word tackle the issue. I think they explore the issue. I think they allow us to understand various aspects of trans people, female to male, male to female tra uh, trans people, however they identify in their gender. Um, we're very proud to have these films submitted and include them for our audiences. We've got some very good entertainment films as well. Uh, Still Waiting in the Wings is a sequel to our friends from from two years ago our new york musical broad off broadway queens are still very much off broadway and still busking their way to hopefully uh, near stardom and we're looking forward to showing sharing that with our audience and our old favorite friend charlie david the gay canadian filmmaker a lot of people will know him from his roles in the past he's always been a very big supporter of our festival his latest film shadowlands very dark very sexy very disturbing very innovative film. Uh, it's an anthology of three gay stories set in the 30s, set in the 50s, and in the early 60s. It's always a bit of a, a, a challenge to do a period piece, but he pulls off three incredible stories very well, and it's always a joy to watch his films. How many films in the festival in total? 57. 57 films over 10 days, but we have about 35 short films curated into uh, six feature film slots. So that's why big, a lot of films to see, but they're in absolutely watchable packs. I think there's going to be something for every type of audience member. Some people are really documentary fundies and other people just like to watch a feature or two. But we've got everything, I think, for the audiences out there. Where exactly in Durban is the Gay and Lesbian Film Festival being held this year? So a lot of people would love to see things in a theatre or in a cinema. Both are ideal venues, but we're unable to make that happen this year. We have managed to partner with uh, Urban Lime, uh, um, property development and urban regeneration specialists. People will know them from Cape Town and now in Durban and Florida Road. So we've chosen Florida Road in Durban as a well-known potential tourism destination for, for the public. Um, we've got a property at the top of Florida Road, 344 Florida Road. It's a former art gallery that we've now con we're going to be converting into screening room space. And it's a terrific uh, um, experience, I think, for the audience. It's going to be a bit of a challenge for us. We've never done it in this, this particular pop-up kind of variety, but we have very strong partners. Frankie's Entertainment, again, with sound and lighting. God, we're going to make it absolutely gorgeous. So I think people can look forward to experiencing it in a, in a great way. You talk about the challenges. Uh, do you have any sponsors? This year, no headline sponsors. And one of the great tragedies is that as South Africa is, is really sort of eking her way through a recession, a lot of corporates, I think, saw the writing on the wall and they started to withdraw their commercial sponsorships out there. Certainly, we as the LGBTIQ community are seeing less support for events and, and what we want. I mean, we're just coming off the back of the LGBTIQ plus business summit uh, earlier this week. So there's, there is a great challenge that we're facing. And nonetheless, this is what the great, I think the great thing about our festival is that there is, apart from the passion that I'm bringing into it and the risk, obviously, that I take in making it happen, it's the supportive group of people that come around and in our volunteer pool and Tolko and Daiko and David and Dylan um, and Nontlantla and, and the others in Tombi who 
are all com in, in their various ways contributing their time and their passion to make that very much a community cultural festival event. And once we've got our ducks in a row, as we always tend to do every year, we're able to bring the audience these wonderful screenings. You know, I've always said we'll screen for one member of the audience or 100 member of the audience. It doesn't matter. The point is these are wonderful films and these stories need to be shared. So tickets, more information? Right. Tickets, uh, people can go to our website, uh, www.dgliff.org.za. Or you can Google Durban Gay and Lesbian Film Festival. You can find us on Google and on Facebook. Tickets are 40 Rand each. I think we're very reasonable in that respect. Our opening night will be 80 Rand. Uh, you can even get a silver festival pass, which is always an innovation we've introduced, which is uh, 250 Rand for 10 tickets, which is, I mean, 25 Rand for a movie is really worth it. Um, and also something I want to put in here, we, we have a growing community component to this in our uh, festival pool, ticket, ticket pool, where people can donate tickets into the pool that allows us to share it with underprivileged and disadvantaged members of our community. And that includes members who are students and or uh, senior citizens. There are a lot of people who would love to be able to see a movie these days who just cannot afford the experience. And we want to really expand that so that anybody who really wants to see the film can come and enjoy it. Finally, here is Zianda chatting to Papi Muloi about challenges faced by high school students. I guess the radio where you are family. My name is Zianda and you are listening to Rainbow Talk and I'm back again uh, right at the high school UJ MNU debate and their topic is uh, failing to protect LGBTQ plus rights uh, leaves the LGBTQI community vulnerable to human rights officers. With me I have a group of two students and they're going to be introducing themselves quite shortly. Can you Hello guys, how are you? Good. We're good, we're well. Yeah. And you just guys introduce yourselves and tell us where you're from. Well, I'm Mpomo Loy from Kempton Park. And how do you identify us? Identify, what do you mean by identify? Uh, why are you here? Oh, we're here um, to, how can I put this, stand for gay people. Because we solemnly believe that we cannot say um, we are all born free, yet there's that number of people being discriminated, um, being tortured, executed for who they are. Because I feel like we could live on what Michael Jackson used to say, heal the world. Let's, let's move into those steps of healing the world, making it a better place, but including gay people as well, lesbians as well, bisexual. Because I feel like we should not be placed in, play, in like spaces where we are given labels that no, he's gay, um, she's straight, she's, those are just tags mm -hmm. we should not be given tags we should all be seen as one thing all right uh, so are you a high school student yes i am uh, what are the current challenges that you're facing being at high school and being the person that you are without having to conform to any identity i like your perspective on that well firstly first um as as a student we find it hard to how can i put this breathe around that community because you would want to do something but you're afraid of doing it because you start thinking of, what if I get beaten up for being who I am? What if I get um, stoned for who I am? What if I'm not seen in a particular group of people for who I am? But one thing I've learned, you're not alone in the fight. You always have friends. Surround your people. Surround yourself with positive people, regardless of what people say. Stand by who you are. Don't lose yourself. As, a, as an individual, you have to have morals. Stand with your morals. Stand strong. Although there are sticks and stones that will come on your path, stand strong. Use those bricks and those stones to build yourself an empire. Don't let, the, don't let it be your downfall. Stand on its stake. No matter how hard it may seem, some things are just obstacles, challenges that are testing your strength. And you are supposed to stand strong regardless of what happens. Wow, that's quite insightful. One more question. In your school, uh, how is the attitude from your teachers and your fellow schoolmates? Let me say about the staff particularly. How, do you, how, you, how are you handling that one being in that same high school? And what is the current environment uh, regarding LGBTQ plus rights in your particular high school? Okay, with that, teachers are more friendly to that. But the thing is, our main aim should be our peers, the youth. Um, some of them are quite ignorant. Regardless of how much you want to teach them about it. We keep teaching and teaching and teaching, but nothing's going on. So to get it, we cannot keep on teaching. There's something that needs to be done. You cannot sit and talk. Move. Provide action. Because with that, in my school, it's hard. Trust me, it's quite hard because there are some learners that will make our lives a living hell. They'll, they'll literally say to you that, I, I hate you. I hate your kind. And with that, it's not that because um, 
how can I place it? There's something wrong that we did. No. People will hate you because of what, the right things that you are doing. And people hate that about us, gay people. We do good, and then they hate that. You will never see um, a gay person who's broke. Hence, we are more vulnerable into this world that we live in. Thank you so much. Uh, that's Papi Muloy. Be sure to catch Rainbow Talk every weekday between 12 and 3 p.m. Standard South African time right here on Gay SA Radio, where you are family.